plastic things that we use every day are, of course, convenient and extraordinarily cheap to produce. But what happens after we use them? According to researchers, mankind produces so much plastic garbage that it would be possible to cover the entire coastal area of the world with sacks of the stuff. Unfortunately, a major portion of this refuse ends up in the ocean. This floating garbage is unevenly distributed. Currents and winds cause it to accumulate in particular parts of the oceans. Gradually, the plastic that has arrived on our shores is surrounding entire continents. The latest garbage accumulation found in the late 90s is in the northern part of the Pacific Ocean and is called the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. According to various estimates, the mass of this waste is up to 100 million tons, and the patch area is anywhere from 270,000 to 579,000 square miles. That's about one and a half million square kilometers. It's difficult to determine more accurate dimensions, as all of this is in and under the water. But for comparison, the size of Madagascar is about 193,000 square miles. That's a half million square kilometers. And Greenland is 772,000 square miles. That's about 2 million square kilometers. In other words, this patch is somewhere between the size of Madagascar and Greenland. Not bad for a pile of rubbish, right? But we're just getting started. This amazing record could be beaten by a patch off the coast of Chile, discovered in 2016. A fifth of this waste, of which this newly formed island consists, is tossed overboard from passing ships. The rest is runoff from sewers and waterways along the shores. Calculations of environmentalists vary, but there is one estimate that as much as 8 million tons of plastic enters the Earth's oceans every year. This is about 3% of the total of all of the world's waste. Asian countries are considered to be the main polluters, primarily China, where industry is booming to the detriment of the environment, and to which not much attention is paid. New continents might be considered a good thing, especially for big thinkers who believe our planet is suffering from overpopulation. But plastic in the ocean is really a huge problem, and it's not a matter of aesthetics. Pieces of garbage carried by waves under the influence of sunlight become fragile, and when colliding with rocks, ship hulls, or pieces of other debris, easily break into smaller and smaller fragments. Birds and sea creatures swallow these tiny pieces of plastic, thinking it's food. In the best case, the foreign object will pass through the animal's gut. But in other cases, it can kill the animal or remain in the body. We don't know what happens to a living creature in whose stomach the plastic hangs around for years. It might release a small amount of poisonous substances and poison the poor animal's body. Poisons can also reach other living beings, including humans, along the food chain. Especially if, for example, a pack of commercial fish feeds in a littered area. Moreover, the plastic itself can absorb poisonous substances such as mercury. This is not just a matter of toxic danger, however. Sea animals can become enmeshed in scraps of fishing nets and other waste, and also become entangled in polyethylene products such as plastic bags and tapes. At the same time, due to the debris, the water surface reflectivity and light permeability changes, affecting inhabitants of the lower layers. Over time, the problem will only increase. According According to some estimates, the total mass of plastic in the ocean will reach that of the total mass of all fish in the ocean by the middle of the century. There are two obvious solutions to this problem. One, to find ways to purify the water of the debris that is already in it. And two, to reduce the rate of pollution. Or, ideally, to stop it altogether, perhaps by moving to the use of biodegradable plastics. The first approach is a favorite of many environmentalists, but there are also some interesting possibilities in the works for the secondary use of non-degradable plastic. There are new kinds of utensils and containers, building materials, and even fabric created from used plastic. But this requires a sustained effort in the separate collection of garbage, using aggressive consumer sorting and distribution to processing plants. But it can work. In Japan, for example, the Kansai International Airport and a metallurgical plant are built on artificial islands of garbage. And in Tokyo Bay, Yumenoshima, or Dream Island, is an artificial island made from waste landfill and includes a park, a stadium, a museum, and beautiful giant tropical greenhouse domes, among other things. So they were able to dispense with millions of tons of garbage. They made it toxicologically safe, and they increased the size of the country. Not bad. 
A similar project has been implemented in Singapore. A garbage island there has been planted with trees, and the ecological situation surrounding it is quite favorable and has become rather popular among local fishermen. A team put together by an heir to the famous Rothschild dynasty was able to travel from San Francisco to Australia on a yacht made from plastic bottles, and the ship, with honor, withstood the mighty ocean's test. Designers and architects are constructing entire buildings using plastic waste. These are, however, rather conceptual constructions that do more to draw attention to the problem than solve it. There are also several projects in the pipeline to cleanse the oceans using contraptions that would capture the waste already in the water without disturbing the marine inhabitants. The growth of garbage patches is also being checked with the help of prohibitive measures. In some countries and states, it's now forbidden to give customers free plastic bags in supermarkets. And there are bans on disposable utensils made from non-degradable plastic. The problem is that it's not particularly easy to make plastic that is both eco-friendly and at the same time can withstand temperature extremes, such as going through a microwave cycle or simply sitting in a refrigerator for a period of time. And even if we can find an optimal solution for such production, it's always possible that the manufacturing process itself could create more environmental problems than an innocuous plastic island. But we can replace much of this stuff with a variety of different biodegradable plastics made from such things as starch, cellulose, and other similar materials. Common polyethylene plastic bags can be replaced with those made from starch. They do easily decompose, but unfortunately can at this point carry only a small load. There are also biodegradable bags made by the OXO company. During the manufacture of the polyethylene, substances are added that accelerate the plastic's decomposition. Then, just simple heat and ultraviolet light can turn a plastic bag into a small amount of debris, and then microbes in the soil complete the biodegradation process in a matter of just a couple of years. There is biodegradable packaging that can crumble into dust during a short period of between one to five years. But again, this requires the right perfect conditions. For example, composting, contact with water, and ultraviolet light. But in general, the prospects for this industry clearly do exist. Here's something interesting. There have been a number of statements in the press that the amount of garbage is actually much lower than what scientists say. So either it is disappearing somehow or the scientists are lying. So which is it? Well, indeed, there is the possibility that the plastics in the ocean are breaking up into such extremely small particles that they can no longer be seen in the water. Or perhaps the debris is sinking to the bottom of the oceans along with the fish that swallowed it and died. Or maybe marine dwellers get snagged by chunks of garbage and are dragged down under the weight. We know that some of the garbage gets frozen in the ice of the Arctic and Antarctic, and some is carried back ashore onto beaches, for example. Some rocks recently appeared in Hawaii that turned out to be partially made of plastic. Heated plastics bind together grains of sand, pebbles, shells, and other natural materials. In this case, it's possible to distinguish little broken things like toothbrushes, toys, and other such things embedded in the conglomeration. But there is, however, a more optimistic possibility. Until now, it was believed that human-made polymers couldn't be consumed or biodegraded by any of the inhabitants of our dear planet. But one more modern view holds that the mysterious disappearance of debris in the ocean may be due to colonies of bacteria that have learned somehow that if they cannot consume and destroy the plastic, they can, nevertheless, crush it into smaller and smaller pieces. True, this view has not yet received widespread acceptance, and the life and whereabouts of these plastic particles is still unexplained even after this grinding down. More recently, it turned out that at least one insect has learned to deal with at least polyethylene. The larvae of a common pest called wax moths are able to eat a hole in a plastic bag in a mere 40 minutes. This was a chance discovery by a biologist named Federica Bertoccini, who, when studying the creatures, cleaned out one of the beehives that they had invaded and put the detested pests into a plastic bag. Later, she looked at the bag and saw that they had eaten a bunch of holes in it. A later experiment showed that a hundred wax moth caterpillars could break down 92 milligrams of polyethylene in just half an hour. Ethylene glycol is the byproduct, normally a poisonous substance, but it does not harm the moths. 
Moreover, even regular polyethylene products were shown to be decomposed by the moth larvae. Scientists now intend to isolate the enzyme that the insect synthesizes naturally and then artificially recreated. How it all works is that it turns out polyethylene is similar in structure to beeswax. And for these pests that move into beehives, eating beeswax is their usual routine. This ability shown by the wax moth larvae is especially relevant, given that polyethylene accounts for about 40% of the world's plastic garbage found in dumps. Perhaps nature really will learn how to cope with polymers, much as it coped with the, at first, indigestible cellulose from trees 400 million years ago. The first trees were once completely inedible for bacteria and fungi. It was, 400 million years ago, an environmental disaster, as dead trees littered the world. But they are now easily composed down into mere dirt. So we can draw such an optimistic conclusion. It's our duty to assist nature as best we can, at the very least, for our own health and comfort. It's not so difficult to be conscious of the fate of a discarded thing. To bring a cloth bag instead of taking a plastic one to a store. To reuse that bag many times. And to not get carried away using disposable plates, packaging, and utensils. And to use paper products in their place when you can. Separating refuse by type helps the planet, and using energy-saving light bulbs and solar cells significantly reduces the total impact on the environment. Land that is given over to landfills is difficult to return to normal, and even a single discarded plastic bag or soda bottle can spoil one's impression of a picturesque panorama. We have learned to keep our bodies and our homes clean. The next step should be the purity of the planet. Don't wait for your neighbors, friends, and family to act first. It truly all begins with you.